Thank you, Bill. Uh, I'm Paul W1SCX here from Gardner. I recently purchased a new transceiver. Yeah, why don't you leave them on there, Bill? Uh, a new a new two meter 440 transceiver for my car. And I know technology's been advancing since the last time I bought a new radio, but it's just absolutely blown away with the capabilities of it. So it took a while, but I had to totally rethink how I was doing my radio. So let me get into a, sh a screen share here uh, so that those online can see the presentation. And there we go. All right. So anyhow, what we're going to be talking about is programming the new radios that are out there, uh, whether it be a mobile unit or a portable unit. It, it doesn't make much difference. I mean, it's, it's not the way it used to be. Uh, let's see here. There we are. Before I get started, keep in mind, operating your radios in a mobile environment is just as hazardous as trying to use a phone or texting while driving. So uh, you've been warned, right? Uh, keep that in mind and operate uh, operate your, your mobile and your handheld safely. And especially when you're out with your handheld, make sure you're not tripping over stuff or falling into the public fountain. You've seen those YouTubes, I'm sure, All right? As far as monitoring public safety communications, you want to be very careful about doing that. In Massachusetts, it's perfectly legal to listen to the police while mobiling around in your car. In other states, not so much. Uh, big no-nos in the state of New York, Connecticut, New Jersey, uh, Virginia, they take a very dim view on having uh, you listening to police transmissions in those states. Uh, the Communications Act of 1992 made it legal for ham transceivers to receive public safety communications. That doesn't give you the excuse to listen while mobiling in those states that have laws preventing that. So be careful, right? So where do we come from and how did we get to today? Back in 63, the FCC put out a mandate that all land mobile radio, that's be public safety and businesses that use the VHF and UHF land mobile frequencies go from AM to FM, they made it mandatory. Some of those agencies and businesses were already FM, but they had to narrow down their uh, deviation to five kilohertz to make more room on the band, right? And with that, at the same time, the amateur radio community was primarily AM for voice modes on VHF and UHF. With that, 1963 mandate, that meant there was a ton of equipment that came on the surplus market, right? A lot of those old FM radios uh, were, were, were coming around and being made available to hams, right? And you started seeing radios like these show up in hams' cars and on their, uh, and on their benches, right? Some of the more popular ones were the uh, Motorola T-Power, uh, GE Progress Line, the RCA um, LD series. These were tube radios that fit in a trunk, right? Uh, the, uh, the, the T power used a transistorized power supply, but as it was still a tube radio, still ran on high voltage. Uh, the progress, the prog line, as they called it, and the RCAs, they were all tube radios, and they had vibrators in the power supply to generate the high voltage. Right, uh, the uh, car phone was a hybrid. Receiver was all solid state. A good portion of the transmitter was solid. Uh, transmitter was solid state, uh, but the uh, uh, the finals and drivers were tubes. Right, you could buy these radios new if you wanted to, uh, but they were they were rather expensive. Right, 
Uh, for example, I remember seeing in 1965, my local police department uh, updating their cruiser fleet to AMC ambassadors at $2,195 base price for each one of those cruisers. The Motorola Motrax that they put in were $1,995, okay. $200 less than what the car costs. So they were very expensive radios. Right? They were absolutely superb quality, right? uh, those radios at that time. Right? Um, if you look at the picture on the right, that is a GLB channelizer. That was engineered by one of the finest um, RF engineers that I ever knew. His name was Gil Bolke. His call sign was W2EUP. He was one of the uh, uh, premier repeater builders in the Buffalo area where I came from. And he had a whole line of these synthesizers, right? These radios that we're talking about were all crystal controlled. And uh, you would drop in a crystal and if you were lucky enough to have a four channel radio and a four channel control head, uh, like the Motrac that you're seeing there, uh, then uh, you were pretty good, but you were stuck on four different frequencies. But if you had a GLB synthesizer in one of those crystal uh, positions, then you were free to go anywhere on the band uh, that you needed, that you uh, wanted to go. And they had them available for two meters, 220, 440, uh, and so forth. So FM was becoming the uh, primary uh, phone mode on VHF and UHF, right, in that area, right? Uh, once the surplus started to run out, then we got some of the manufacturers involved, all right? And uh, some of those like Regency uh, was, a, was a big one, uh, Drake, Icom, Wilson, Sonar, and there are others as well uh, that were out there providing amateur radio, uh, two meter, 220, 440 uh, uh, FM equipment. But uh, did you ever think you're ever gonna get out of one of my lectures? And not hear something about heath kits. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. All right. In the meantime, there was also something happening in a similar industry. Right. Uh, a lot of people were becoming interested in listening to their police departments, their fire departments, and they were buying these uh, tunable receivers. Right. If you were a, a, a police or fire department and needed to monitor another frequency, you would get uh, one of these types of radios that was crystal controlled or the GE, RCA, and Motorola had dedicated receivers that were all crystal controlled. But consumers were buying these in, uh, in single or multi-band radios, they were tunable. Uh, but they didn't perform too well. For example, I had this very model and I would tune into my local fire department and that happened to be on 154.13 megahertz. The city of Buffalo fire department, which was not very far away, was at 154.19. And I would receive both of them perfectly clear on this receiver. So uh, they were a bit broadbanded uh, until of course, in the early seventies, they started coming out with scanners Right, that's an eight-channel Regency. Uh, Radio Shack had them, Bearcat had them, uh, and you had, you know, people buying these in four, eight, or sixteen-channel uh, scanners. They were all crystal controlled, and they did work pretty darn well. Uh, then something funny happened. Um, Regency got the idea that, hey, we've got a very good scanner, and as you saw in the previous photo, Regency also made two-way radios, commercial and ham radio. And then they came out with this guy, right? Uh, the MR2MS uh, or HR2MS. It was a VHF high band scanner tuned to the ham band with a transmitter. And if you were, uh, you were a ham back in the day and you had one of these in your car or your house, we're big man on campus, because you were listening to the local repeaters and the simplex frequencies on, on a scanner, and it was, it was absolutely wonderful. Uh, and then, of course, as time goes on, we're starting to get in, into the more modern stuff, and you start to see radios like this, right? 
uh, solid state, of course, microprocessor control, and memories. Uh, this radio is from the very late 80s, uh, the Kenwood TM2500 series. It came in a 25 watt or 45 watt, or even at this at that time, a 70 watt mobile. All right. Uh, this radio was the radio to have at the time uh, because it was not only available in high power, uh, but it had 16 programmable memories to it. And it had a helical front end that made it as bulletproof as any Motorola radio out there at the time. Right? So technology was improving. Right? But as time goes on, you know, you had to start thinking about, you know, how these radios have evolved. And the biggest thing about them, you know, the transmitters are transmitters are transmitters. So it's all in the receiver, right? Uh, so uh, beyond those days, all right, uh, let's see here. Uh, the current radios that we've got now, even, even a decade ago, the stuff that we've got is incredible, right? Uh, the dual band radio is available nowadays, and, and we're talking both portables and mobiles, but we're going to stick with the mobiles for this example, right? Uh, it would be a dual band radio that has one receiver in it, but that receiver is multi-band. So you could program your 2 meter and your 440, uh, uh, 440 frequencies into it and operate, uh, and some radios... Uh, could even go beyond that aircraft band, uh, 800 megahertz band, and a typical example of that would be the ICOM IC208, and that's a really great radio, but it has 300 memories to it for programming. Right? Uh, the next type of radio would be a dual band with dedicated. VHF and UHF receivers. In other words, it's got a transmitter that's dual band and then separate VHF and UHF receivers in it. And a typical example would be the IC208. Uh, the yellow characters are the two meter side of the radio. The green characters are the 440 side. And there were two real separate receivers in there and they would independently uh, scan and program uh, and you could receive both at the same time. So got one of those? Yes, I do. That's on my main my main yeah. position. So they're a great radio. Matter of fact, it is the radio. All right. So anyhow, uh, beyond that, the current rock copper radios and the one that I bought <coughs> just blew my mind. All right. One thousand memories in the thing. All right. But the unique part of it is its two receivers are multi-band. The IC208 has one receiver that's multi-band. The new radio I got, the Elinco DR735, has two separate multi-band receivers. So you can have one side of the radio receiving a VHF frequency and the other side of the radio also receiving a VHF frequency or one VHF UHF or UHF UHF. So the radios are becoming far more flexible as to what you're doing. So what it really takes nowadays is a whole different mindset about how you're going to program your radio. What are you going to do with the radio? And oh yeah, by the way, just so you get the idea that, you know, why are you buying such a complex radio? Well, they're not really complex in, the, in, 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 in what they're doing, but this radio I bought for $308 brand spanking new from HRO. That's not a lot of money for a radio especially when coming out of Japan instead of out of China. So the quality is much better, but they're not expensive. So you're going to look for a decent dual band these days. You're going to get one of these, like it or not. So now you can keep it simple and put in your local stuff and be done, or you can start to get adventurous. And if you're doing anything with public safety, uh, public service events, that's where these things really start to shine. If you travel, right? 
And we're talking, you know, you're not just out of the north central mass area, but you're going down to Worcester or you're going over to Western Mass or you frequent Boston every once in a while, or you got a place out in the Cape. Having these kinds of radios is, can really allow you to get a lot more fun out of your radio, right? So a thousand channels, how am I gonna manage a thousand channels in my radio, all right? Um, so think of it as a scanner because that's what it really is and it's got a transmitter in it, right? A thousand channels, right? And these things had so many channels in them, the manufacturers knew that they would have to come up with a scheme for helping uh, work with these radios. So they created banks, right? In other words, you'd have certain channels that were dedicated to certain banks. For example, you've got a 500 channel radio, you could have 10 banks of 50 channels per, right? But that was very inefficient. For example, uh, I wanna monitor five frequencies for my Gardner public safety stuff. A couple of police frequencies, a couple of fire frequencies, the highway department, maybe the, the housing department, the local government, right? So you got a handful of frequencies, you put them into a bank, right? Let's say I've got six frequencies I wanna to listen to, that's 44 wasted channels. So what the manufacturer started doing finally is making the memory, uh, the memory uh, dynamic, right? So in other words, you got a thousand slots to put frequencies, and then each of those frequencies you can program into or, or become active in any one or all of the banks, right? Uh, for example, 146.52, the simplex frequency. I want to monitor that almost all the time. So regardless of where I go, I've got 146.52 programmed and active in each of the 10 banks in the radio, right? So think of the banks first. And to help you with that, what are your listening priorities, right? Are you there just for the QSOs and just the ham radio stuff? Do you want to be able to keep an ear on your local police and fire when you're out in the car or at home, right? Uh, so you want to think about what your listening priorities are, right? And what you want to listen to, everything, right? Your, your local police and fire, you want to have all of the repeaters in Massachusetts available at your fingertips, right? So think of it geographically. If I had every repeater in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts plugged into my radio and I was scanning them, it would take forever to scan from one end of the list to the other, right? And if I had channels and I could do lockouts, well, now you're managing the radio actively and only bringing in channels as you, as you go along. Again, watch the safety factor you're driving, right? It becomes a pain. So if you're thinking of programming your radio, first think of the banks, right? What do you want to listen to? Right? And where are you going? Right? For example, when I'm in town, all right, uh, I listen to one bank program for public safety. So there's just a few channels in it. And I'll tell the radio, okay, on the right side of the display is gonna be my public safety and I'm gonna to listen to bank 10, right? For the ham radio side, I'm gonna program 10 frequencies for local repeaters into the left side of the radio in bank nine. So now I'm just listening to those two banks. Frequently, once a week, I take my wife down to South Worcester to a physical and occupational therapy session. Well, I'll knock out bank nine and I'll put in bank eight, which includes all the repeaters in Worcester County. So now I can drive from Gardner to South, uh, South Worcester and I'm listening to and scanning all the repeaters that my radio can hear in Worcester County, right? So I've made three clicks on my radio and I've got a whole new set of frequencies in there. I'm not having to worry about lockouts and all that stuff. 
So it becomes safer to operate the radio, right? When you're outside of the home territory where you're at, right, you can program for a full county, as I mentioned, right, or other bands, depending on where you're going geographically, right? And you do that on a regular basis, right? You can also pre-program channels and banks for where you're traveling to. For example, we go to Western New York on a not as frequent basis as I want to, but frequent, frequent enough that I've got a bank programmed for Western Mass. I have a bank programmed for Eastern and Central New York. I have a bank programmed for Western New York, and I have a uh, uh, local bank programmed out there. So they're already into the system, all right? And that's what we're talking about, right? In addition to that, depending on your radio, you can get assistance from other products. For example, the Blue Cat is an interface that will interface your Android phone or your Android tablet to the radio. And then you would download a repeater database into your device. And then looking at a map on your device, you can say, oh, gee, I'm traveling through this area. I want all the repeaters in this geographical area. And you tell it how big. And it will dump those into your radio. And you have full use of those, of those frequencies, right? In addition to that, if you want to go to a specific repeater, you just touch that on your screen and your radio is instantly programmed. So lots of cool ways to make this happen. And that interfa interface device, by the way, is 70 US dollars as of today. So not real expensive. All right. Uh, you download a repeater book and a database and just touch the screen or the region where you're going. Right. This is how my radio is programmed. And it, it took me a while to decide just how I wanted to do it. And as I mentioned, my radio in the car all the time now is tuned to banks nine and 10. And the radio just does its scan thing, uh, stops on where it needs to. And I'm not trying to listen to hundreds of repeaters across the Commonwealth. I'm just listening to repeaters that are here locally, right? And again, when I go to Central Mass, I'll swap in Bank 8, swap out Bank 9. If I go to visit my kids in Pittsfield or I got to go down to the Big E, I'll bring in the Western Mass uh, repeaters, right? And that's all the 2 meter and 440 repeaters. So how did I manage to program in almost 500 channels into this radio in just a few hours. Okay. And I did what was, uh, I bought a software program. Uh, screen sharing has stopped because the external display is disconnected. Okay. Well, let's take a look at that. We're going to go back and do that again, but let me bring up this software first. And zoom. Screen share. Excuse me once. There we go. All right, and watching the monitor over there, we're good. So this is RT systems. There are other programming systems that are out there. Uh, this was a $50 thing. It came with a cable. There's a free one out there called Chirp. Okay, where'd we go here? Let's hope that stays up. All right, so we went to Chirp, and uh, here we are with, uh, uh, with, with the RT systems. So I can program in the frequencies, right? I can, I can plug in. Uh, anything that I need to, uh, 146.52, and 
my transmit frequency already comes in automatically. I have no off offset because it, it the program knows that it's a simplex frequency. Um, I can go to an operating mode here, which is FM, FM narrow, what have you, and I will just leave it at automatic. And now this frequency is ready to go to my radio. But, you know, did I do this 500 some odd times? Not likely. One of the advantages of having this software and others is that you can go to external data, right? Uh, you have radio reference, repeater book, R Finder. These are repeater da databases online. R Finder and radio reference are subscription services. Repeater book is free. So let's say I'm taking a trip to Las Vegas and I can type in the location name. I can tell it, give me a radius of 10 miles around Las Vegas. I want the two meter repeaters. I want the 70 centimeter repeaters and go. And now I have all of the repeaters wow. in Las Vegas programmed, right? <clears throat> and what I can do is I'll, oh, wow. and I goofed up that. There we are. What I can do is go down here and I can do a copy. Go back to my original sheet here and we'll pick up 481 and I'll do a paste. And now I have all of those repeaters in the ready to go into the radio, but I've got a couple of more things to do first. I go to settings and bank settings. This is where you can determine what channels go where, right? So we've got the frequency, we've got the call sign or name, we got any notes. This particular radio is analog only. So if I'm scanning all of these repeaters in Las Vegas, one thing I don't want to do is get into digital repeaters. So there's a D star, okay? And I can delete the D star. Uh, mixed mode, okay, uh, let's see here, we've got uh, some DMRs and fusions, so we'll highlight those, and we'll delete, and I have another D-Star, DMR machine, <laughs> And we've got another DMR here, right? So these 40 repeaters are now ready to be uploaded into the radio, but I haven't selected a bank and I'm gonna choose bank 10. So there you go, we got bank 10 highlighted, copy, And we'll highlight all of these guys. Paste. Now they're all selected. They're all ready to go into, into the radio. And now I simply connect the radio, push it off. The radio is now programmed. Okay. So it only, once I got past the learning curve, it didn't take long to parse out the radio the way that I wanted it, the way that I'm gonna use it, All right? 
Uh, the nice thing about this and what helps make it more efficient is in the old system where you had 50 channels per bank, right? And I wanted 14652 in each of the banks. I had to have 10 different 14652s programmed into the radio. The way this is laid out and the way this software works, I've got one particular frequency and I can assign it to one more or all of these banks, making it very efficient. So there's only one instance of 14652 out of the 500 channels that are programmed in the radio. I just tell it, where do I want it to be available when I'm listening? Right. So there's definitely a learning curve to it, but I think you can get a whole lot more fun out of your ham radio uh, with the new dual banders. And that means portables or, uh, or mobile units. Uh, they both work the same way. Uh, just so be careful of the, of the models that you're buying, uh, how some of the Chinese radios work, I don't know yet. I haven't played with that. Uh, but for this, this worked for me. Um, one other cute feature of the Alinko radio is it gives me the ability to change the display backlight, the color of it. So for a police department, when the police department is received, it turns blue. Right? A fire department turns red. EMS turns green. Right? A ham frequency, it turns amber. Right? There's a total of 16 colors that you can get uh, with this. Whenever I transmit, that channel turns white. Right? So safety going down the road, not only can I determine what I'm getting and I'm listening to, but I also get the service out of the corner of my eye on that display. You know, what is it? Is it a ham frequency? Is it whatever? But if you're not into doing the public safety thing, all right, is it a VHF repeater? Is it a UHF repeater? Repeaters outside your normal area, repeaters inside, you have complete control over it on this particular radio. Uh, Olinko is the only one that's doing that. And uh, this is my first Olinko radio, so I'm not sure, you know, jury's still out. Right now it's looking pretty good. Kenwood, Yezu, ICOM, good stuff. Um, you know, you've got Canon, Nikon, Sony, and then the price leader Pentax, right? Kenwood, Yezu, Icom, price leader, Linko. Yes, I have a Pentax also. So <laughs> gives you an idea of my mindset. So that's that. I hope that was informative. Any questions, comments? Um, so I think that's great. I think it's really important to focus on the program your radio, whether it be an HP or mobile. There's been a lot of situations over the years, I've been a ham radio up there, and you talk to somebody and it's like, you know, what are you trying to have the range or the repeater? Well, there's another repeater in the range. The other person doesn't have that program. They don't have any program. They only have one repeater program. Take the time now to avoid that situation, because then the conversation, our conversation just stopped, right? You go to the range, they could have kept going, but they didn't have everything program. But obviously, they're not going to fumble around with another guy. Yeah. But yeah, take the time. The program radio, if you drive around a certain area, you use your mass, other than hands, or whatever, go through, use the software, and, and find stuff that in many ways you get the frequency. Put it all in your radio the way you like it. That's all, you know, outlined here, and, and put it in there. And then when someone says, hey, meet me, or this, this repeater is busy, let's go over to the other repeater. It recovers the same area. You have an option because you met on this repeater, you, you, you broke in, so you agreed to be here, but it's busy. You, hey guys, get a bigger call. Hey, Jack, meet me over at this repeater so we can chat. It's free over there. Go over there. But if Jack didn't program his radio, then I'm like, oh, I can't, Kevin, sorry. All right, bye, Jack. <laughs> I'll talk to someone else. No. But it, it really does come in handy to put the effort in up front to program your radio. Um, and then you have options, whether you're driving down the road or have your HP. Uh, yeah, great question. Great. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Yeah, thank how, how, how do you download? Do you do it? Is there a USB port or something on the 
uh, different radios do it differently, right? Uh, most of them have uh, an interface port. Some of them you'll take the microphone out and the and the dedicated cable for that radio will plug into the mic port or it will plug into the speaker port uh, and it's just serial communications from there. So the radio knows the difference between, okay, hey, I'm, I'm a speaker out, but when I see this particular type of input, I'll become an RS-232 transceiver on this particular port. So it all depends on the make of the radio. It depends on, you know, where, where, which one you got. Uh, Bluetooth is a big up and coming thing. Because and, I have hearing aids. Yeah. You're talking about talking on the, in this way, all I got to do is just push it and I can talk to my, you know, I can use my hearing aids to communicate. One radio, one radio that's out that does Bluetooth is uh, Anytone. Anytone? Yeah. Go to bridgecomsystems.com and you can get the information on that. Yeah, it's, it's taken quite a while, but even the commercial uh, two-way two radios are, are now coming out Bluetooth compatible. Oh, cool. so, yep, definitely. All right, anything, anything else, anybody? All right, and don't forget, for those that, that, are, that are new to this, you got a club to come to to get questions answered, All right? So there's plenty of help out there. Yep. Thank you, Bill. Excellent, Paul, thank you. You get you new people here. You'll get to know Paul a lot because he does a lot of our presentations. <laughs>